Yeah, there we go. Hi everybody, hey, it's Robert Earl out here at the Eco Ranch Sustainable Living Education Center in Far West Texas with not Cascade the Wonder Dog, but Sherman the One-Eyed Toothless Dog. A couple of reasons he's in it. Number one, Cascade is out uh, with our latest work exchange guests taking a walk, and I don't like them to walk around the desert alone. I like him to be there as a coyote slash snake buffer. And two, his tumors come back a little bit, and we may not have a whole lot more opportunity to see uh, Sherman the One-Eyed Toothless Dog. Uh, we are going to get him another surgery, but uh, there's going to be a limit. You can only pull the skin together so much before there's no more skin. So get a look at him. My last, my last hairless and probably one of the last toy American hairless terriers there are out there because the people that, um, that took over the breed when I decided we didn't want to have anything to do with people anymore. We love dogs, but we hate people. Uh, they decided they like a bigger dog, and you know whoever wins the war writes the book. So that's uh, that's what's going on there. So he may be very well be the last toy one left out there. I hope not, but he could be. Anyway, I want to do a short video about our Cornish cross chickens that we're raising. As soon as I put him back. Uh, something unique's going on, and I, I want to document it before the book comes out. And also, my work exchange guest and I were working in here in the coop, and we're bringing this wall up. Debbie asked to have this wall taken all the way up, so while we're taking this wall up, we're going to take this wall up. You can see the sun's hitting me from here. So if I block the sun from the south to south southwest, uh, the, the chickens will be more apt to come in and use this until I actually finish the walls. Uh, so we've been working on that. So with that, I'm going to put him down and we're going to switch over to the nursery because I want to show you something going on with the Cornish Cross group that I'm raising right now. So I've got you angled down a little bit, so I have to, uh, i got to squat here. That's kind of hard for an old man to do. But um, what, we're gonna just, what I wanted to go over with you is where I am with this group, which if you followed us, you know I'm trying to put together a booklet. It'll be about a 50-page book, I hope I'm coming out with it in uh, mid-December, about the comparison between raising heritage breed birds to Cornish crosses. Now, when you go in the grocery store, Cornish crosses are all you see. That's the meat, that's the chicken that you're buying, and it's got all the adulterations that I've gone over and over in it. I won't recap all that. Now, the heritage birds I raised, they weren't just heritage birds. What they were is what's called factory, excuse me, hatchery by hatch. Hatchery by hatch, and I've covered this several times, but it's so important that I can make sure that people know this, so I'm going to cover it again. When somebody that wants to have a few chickens in their backyard, uh, whether they live in a suburban house or a small farm or whatever, when they order 10 hens, don't need roosters to have eggs, so they order 10 laying hens, the factory doesn't hatch 10 hens. The factory hatches roughly 22 or 23 birds. 51% of those birds are going to be males, roosters or cockerels. The rest are going to be hens, the desirable hens. And you got a guy at the line when they're hatching, they hatch and they come out and he's turning them over and I don't know exactly how they sex them, but he's looking at their butt and he's sexing, okay, that's a hen, that's a hen. Oh, rooster, 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 rooster. The roosters get put in a separate place. Now, they don't go to some other guy's farm where they're happily raised and there's, you know, 9,000 bats or chickens running around. They go down an assembly line, and typically they fall into a machine called a macerator, and it's a bunch of fast blades spinning in two different directions. The chick hits that, and he's dead in like a tenth of a second. It's a barbaric death, but it's a very humane death because they don't feel it, and they're barely aware of what's going on because they've hatched, uh, just hatched. But still, it's a waste of a potential resource that could be, and it's a waste of the resources that brought it to that point because you had to feed the hen, the hen had to lay the eggs, the eggs had to be incubated by other. My whole point in the book was, what if we raise just by hatches? Now, when I say we, I mean just those of us that can and want to raise meat birds. What if we raise the by hatch birds instead of the Cornish crosses? Because Cornish crosses have to have a, um, you got to have roosters over here of one breed, hens over here of another. They've got to breed together, but you've got to keep these alive and as adults, which means you're hatching this, hatching this, and keeping both of them. 
breed them together, hatch the chicks, and send them out as Cornish crosses. Now, at least with Cornish crosses, the roosters, it kind of switches there. The roosters are the more desirable because they grow faster. So straight run or both sexes is uh, probably the way I'd say two-thirds of the people that buy them buy them. But uh, the idea is which is more viable cash and time-wise. So the point of my book was not to be skewed but to be totally objective and raise up, and I raised up 300 of the by hatch heritage, bird, heritage breed cockerels, and then I got just 50 uh, Cornish crosses. They sent me 52, I've got 49. So right there, more of these died than died in the whole 300. Not proportionally more, more. I didn't lose but two birds, I believe, or three uh, in the whole 300. So right there, they're a little more fragile, but what are the other differences? What goes on? First batch is done. We did a feed to weight gain ratio on the first batch. That's going to be in the book, and I don't mind telling everybody. We gave them 3.13 pounds of feed for every one pound of live bird we got. Now, if you read any article, any of the forums, any of that stuff on Cornish crosses, Cornish crosses will, rate, will grow at a rate of 3 pounds in for every one pound of live birth. So right there, the difference isn't so great, but the difference actually is in the growth rate, the time it takes. The time is much faster. I took 12 weeks to raise birds up that averaged just under four pounds when we slaughtered them. They were closer to three and a half, and again, I've got the exact figures, closer to three and a half pound live bird when I slaughtered it. If you carry Cornish crosses out to 12 weeks, you're going to be pretty close to a 10-pound carcass. And right after 12 weeks is when they start dying because they're so fat they die of heart attacks or they flip over and can't get back up and the weight of their breast crushes the lungs and they suffocate. But something's going on here that I don't quite understand. My birds turned uh, four weeks a couple days ago and we weighed them. We weighed about 10 of them to get an average and then averaged it. The average weight of these four week old birds is four pounds five ounces. That is bigger than the biggest of the 300 that I raised for 12 weeks. So right there, in terms of time, they're far better. But in terms of the actual cash to raise them, it's a coin toss. It, you know, it might be a penny more or two pennies more a bird. But I was amazed. I'm going to grab one of these pigs. They're down here eating. We call them the fatsos now. Uh, just because they're so fat. Now I want you to realize this bird is a couple days over four weeks old. Take a look at that. Look at the size. Now I'm big. I don't know what my shoulder span is, but I have a 50 inch chest just for comparison. And you see how that bird is just kind of eating my whole chest up. That's a big bird. There's the breast. Yes, I know. And I want you to especially look at, I can't point it out because i got both hands holding them. Gosh, I'm not sure. I think this is a hen. But the breast area, just under the neck, if you can see my finger tapping, see how huge that is? But also look at that big bubble butt. Uh, so, I mean, the, the breast is big, and that's all meat. The bubble butt generally means that it's full of crap about ready to come out. But look at the size of this bird. Okay, now right there, a whole bunch of... Um, a whole bunch of backyard poultry breeders that buy their birds eight or ten at a time and have been have been raising birds for six, seven years, you know, five, ten or fifteen of them a year for five or six years. You, you've all got the answer to my problem. Wait a minute. I've been doing this for 20 years. I spent three years in the commercial egg business. I spent two more years in the feed business. You don't have the answer. We don't know why these birds are so big. They do not have access to anything except the feed because they're a controlled group. So as a control group, they're getting the exact same feed as the other birds got, which is a commercial feed that I approved and sprouted millet, roughly the same amount of sprouted millet per bird as the, the other group got. Why are they this big? We did start them off with feed, 20 feed available to them 24 hours a day. Now that's what I said that all these people are going to jump up and say. Yeah, well, you're feeding them 24 hours a day and that's not good for them. Well, we, aren't, we haven't been feeding them 24 hours a day for about 10 days now. 
We've been feeding them in the morning and that's it. If they eat it up, fine. If they don't eat it up, that's fine. So it's not a matter of feed being available 24 hours a day. And if it was, I would be getting flip over already because the birds would have, the meat would have grown so fast, it would have outgrown the bones, the bones wouldn't be supporting the birds. I don't know what. I don't know why I've got four and a half pound birds here, almost four and a half pound birds here. But this is going to be a real, real interesting test. I'm telling you, it's going to take my book in a whole different direction because how can I tell you to go to heritage birds that are going to take you 16 weeks to get a four and a half pound or a five pound bird when you can get six weeks here? Now the time shouldn't matter to those of us that are growing them uh, for our own consumption, but sometimes time does matter. So I guess we're at a point right here where we're going to say, um, watch the space or stay tuned for more and let's see what happens. And until we know what happens, I'll be here doing the things that we do. And uh, hopefully you'll be wanting to watch it. Remember, we have the uh, live stream that comes out every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. right now, Central Daylight Time. But when the time changes, it'll be Central Standard Time. So for those of you on the East Coast, of course, it's 8 o'clock at night, Eastern Time. And um, you can ask me questions on the live stream and check it out. Um, if you like Cascade the Wonder Dog and um, what we do here, we do have some merchandise and we do need donations to keep this place going. We're going to go through a lot of Portland this winter. Until then, we're just going to keep, I'm going to keep studying on the internet to see if anybody else has had this mystery growth rate. Um, and we'll take it from there and I'll see you with the next video. Until then, it's Robert Earl at the Eco Ranch Sustainable Living Education Center saying, see you later. <laughs>